Good morning, everybody. Let's see. Happy Monday. Let's see if I can make this light a little better. Watch this tricky bit. Building up another curve. This piece is clearly not yet finished, but the top of the piece is right here, so I'm pretty psyched about it. All right. Let's see. Nope, that was right. I'm going to do it again. Down the side. Let's see. Let's fill in this little bit. And then I'll be ready for my outline. Okay. Good morning, everyone. I hope you're doing well and that you had a good weekend of some sort. Um, before I forget, you should all go get a copy of this, um, Tucking the Tales by Sarah Sweat. I saw someone mentioned it already. I go to her website and there's a blog post about it, I think. It's awesome. She shows you all the cool little um, things that she does to anchor. Uh, anchor her tails and the drawings look like this. They're awesome. Um, and she, there's a bunch of her signature um, drawings that she does, and they're fantastic. So it's a PDF download, and it's way worth the uh, cost. It's 20 pages, and she has all her tips for doing the tales. So um, i just pretty excited about it. I thought it was really cool. Um, Good morning from all of you all over the place. Um, it is Monday again. It is finally sunny in Colorado, which is supposed to be 78 today. 78. That's Fahrenheit for those of you across the pond. Um, we don't use sensible scales like 
metric system in the U.S. We have a lot of things that aren't sensible these days. So, um, yeah, Fahrenheit. So welcome from all over Idaho and California and Cape Cod and um, Vancouver, Washington, which I finally figured out is nowhere near Vancouver, British Columbia. I, it took me an embarrassingly long, long time to figure out that Vancouver, Washington is actually fairly close to Portland, Oregon, Kansas City, um, Florida. <laughs> McKenna, that's funny. Um, uh, she realized on Saturday that it was Saturday and uh, we weren't here, but it's Monday and we're back. Um, Vermont and Wisconsin and Minnesota and Michigan um, and Texas. And there, Kathleen is the one I saw who, men who uh, mentioned uh, Tuck the Tails. Tucking, tucking the Tails, Sarah Sweat. Uh, her website is a field guide to needlework.com. And if you don't follow her blog, you really should. It is um, really fantastic. Um, great. Kate mentioned it too. Uh, go find it, you guys. It is uh, fantastic. And Sue, thanks, you guys, all for mentioning it. It was a fun weekend because Tuck the Tales came out. Tucking the Tales. Um, and Paula and uh, lots of people have seen it already. So, um, New Brunswick. I love seeing you from New Brunswick, Karen. That's fun. Um, Anyway, um, <clears throat> oh, Kathleen, <clears throat> great question. I even did vocal exercises this morning and I still have <clears throat> problems. So sorry. Really sorry. Um, <clears throat> Kathleen is asking about the direction that I beat, which is a great question. Um, so when I'm working on things, she's noticing that... Sometimes I beat one direction and sometimes I beat the other. There's no, um, I'm not in my head beating one way or the other on purpose. I don't actually think it matters. So I like to change the shed before I beat that on a loom that has shedding that um, cements the weft where it is. And I really don't think it makes any difference which direction you beat, whether you beat from the edge that the weft is attached to or beat from the open edge of the weft. Um, I really don't think it matters. It might matter on a loom that has shedding that can't be closed. Um, if you're using like a pipe loom that has an open shed in that particular shed, it might be that the weft is looser because you can't close the shed. Um, in the pick shed, if you just pull out your, you know, if the, you let the shed close, then that will be tight, but the other shed won't be. So with that kind of a loom, it could be an issue, but also could lead to ridging on that kind of a loom. On a Mirex, I shift the shed completely and then beat it in. So it, I don't think it matters. It's a great question. Um, Mandy, does the tuck the tails technique replace splicing? Yes. So for those of you who freaking hate my splicing technique, you should get Sarah's PDF. Um, it's super inexpensive. And um, she has, I think, three different tail management methods in there at least. And um, she's using one technique that the um, Navajo use a lot where you um, sort of pull the weft all the way into the shed. So yes, her techniques do not use any kind of splicing. And so those of you who hate splicing are gonna love it. Keep in mind that the kind of weft that you use. The materials you use matter. Um, so not all wefts are the same and not all grab each other the same. So um, if you're using a yarn that's really slippery, just be cognizant of that with any tail um, manipulation like splicing or the way Sarah does it also. Um, hi, Sarah. 
Speaking of Sarah, Sarah, your PDF is awesome. It's really great. And it sounds like people love it. So um, this little piece, let's look at a little bit of weaving on a Monday. And let's see if I can keep this out of the way. So I'm still working on this little guy. Let's see if I can futz with the camera. This tripod has way too many knobs on it. So I moved it down. I got the little butterfly started. I am using silk. Um, like I said, this is the top of the piece, so I'm pretty excited to almost be done with it. And um, I only have one, two, three more of these diagonal lines. So I've been doing an eccentric weft. So I don't know if you noticed what I did when I was building this up, but I do this actually quite a lot. Um, I think most people who build up shapes do this. I wove up and made this shape here, and then I just took that weft straight down the side all the way over to here, and then I built up this shape, perpendicular of course, not eccentrically, and then I, I came down the side here and that's where my tail is. So that meant that I didn't have a bunch of extra tails. I wasn't adding butterflies to do these other shapes. And this, I'm going to put in another one of those silk lines. I did, I feel like I've lied to y'all in the past, so you can see the edge of this one. And um, someone asked if that was the same width and the picks were the same, but I think I've not been using the same number of wefts in each of the bundles. So I think these two lines are thicker. Not that it matters, but I realized last night that I wasn't being consistent with that. So though it does pack down to get thinner, um, if you don't put the same amount of weft strands in your bundle, you will end up with lines that are different thicknesses. I really like this combination. So let's do another one of these. I'm going to make this one thicker with three strands of this. This silk is really thin, so you can easily accommodate extra strands. Um, yeah, Karen. <clears throat> um, there's, uh, this is what, uh, the other, th Karen, you're right. Um, she said that, I love your splicing in Sarah's directions as well. So many ways to deal with tails. Um, having more options in your toolbox is always, well, I say it's always a good thing. In general, I think it's a good thing. Sometimes limitations will get you actually moving, which sometimes too many options paralyzes us. But in general, I think knowing, um, there's a great example in Sarah's PDF about weaving letters, which she's done a lot of, and um, ways to move the tails around when you're weaving letters. And so when you're weaving a little form, you all of a sudden have this thing in your toolbox where you can, oh yeah, Sarah did this thing and I could just use a needle and move this over there. And um, I think it's good to have options. So I agree with you, Karen. So I'm doing that thing again where I'm putting in the eccentric weft and I'm going to get to show you guys the finished piece at some point. It's very exciting. <laughs> uh, this is the piece you'll remember that was supposed to be for renditions, which was a show that um, wasn't it March 15 or something it was due. Anyway, I clearly didn't make it. I submitted something else, which you'll see in the catalog. Ooh, Sue got a copy of the Helena Herrenmark book. 
in the mail. That's a good mail day, Sue. Um, sometimes I do actually, uh, the silk is slippery, so I won't um, cut the ends of it off, but I have actually sometimes been splicing. This is an example of a thread that I would not pull all the way into the shed because it's too thin and slippery. And so, um, even though I just did a little splice, I will still um, take a needle and run those into the fabric just a little bit when I get it um, off the loom because just because it's silk and it is um, not going to play well like the wool will. Wool will stay put, silk will not. Okay. Then there's a little divot thing right here that I need to fill in. A little drop of something. Um, same color or different colors? Let's use the same two colors, but I'm gonna change. I had two pinks and one orange. I'm gonna put two oranges and one pink, just so it's a little different. Oh, the daring things we do when we weave tapestry. Yeah, so Sarah's, I should have it typed out. Sarah's um, website is literally just like it sounds, a field guide to needlework.com. If you just Google Sarah Sweat, S-W-E-T-T, -T, and Sarah has an A, uh, has an H on the end, you will find it. There are other Sarah Sweats, but I don't know any who weave tapestry. Any others who weave tapestry. Mm. So some of these I did, like this one I split the weft and I do kind of like that better. So let's do it again. The warp, I mean, I split the warp. So let's try it. This bundle's a little bit fat for splitting the warp, but I did it before and it worked out. So I'll try it again. So I just went from eight EPI to 16. Can you guys even see that? You probably can't even see what I'm doing. How about that? Is that better? Okay. It was so nice here yesterday that I sat on the deck and did some spinning until it wasn't nice and then I came inside and did some weaving. Uh, I'm ready for some spring. I'm thinking in my head as I'm doing this that this shape is going to be sort of surrounded by this fluffier, like this one. Um, this yarn is going to, the yellow yarn will sort of overpower this shape a little bit. So I'm making it just a tiny bit bigger than I might have otherwise. And it really looks like I should have made this piece of yarn longer. My Mary Lou, I don't know if you're asking me or Sarah, but um, <clears throat> my book does warp splitting. No, my book doesn't have any information on warp splitting. I do think it would be fun to make a video about it though. So that is in my head as I play with this, that it would be a good module for the warp and weft class. Okay. 
One thing I think about, actually, I'm looking at when I, I'm going to change the shed. Okay, so I'll put this to the back. Now I can fill in. <laughs> Marlena, thanks. She saw a picture of my spinning somewhere, <clears throat> probably on Facebook or Instagram. And uh, my spinning is actually not all that even. And um, I have been a very lazy spinner. But I find that there is some, um, I don't need it to be perfect. It's for knitting and uh, I'm pretty pleased with it. So I feel like my spinning teacher would tell me to be a little more careful, but I did do plyback samples for the project I'm doing now so I can compare the size and try to try to make it not quite so random. Okay, I know you can't see through my hands, sorry. Okay, so now we're gonna go back. <clears throat> Weft splitting. Um, So I'm going to go to here. And then I'm I want to fill in this little area. Actually, I'm going to go all the way over the top. If I have to take it out, y'all will forgive me. I want to fill in these low areas though first. So I do wish I could keep the camera from continuously refocusing. But if I do that, if I then I change, if I zoom out, it won't, then it won't focus. Let's see if that's less schizophrenic. Sorry, that was not a PC, not a politically correct use of the word schizophrenic, I apologize. Michelle, I have a lot of lace making thread in every color imaginable, silk. Um, that's cool. I think you could use that for tapestry. I think um, you'll have to experiment because I have no idea what the size of that is. I suspect you're going to have to um, um, use a thin set for that. I am imagining that it is very that it's thread. So you might look at some of the work that Kathy Todd Hooker does. Okay, let's fill this in. These two, what is happening here? Okay, this just has to catch up. I realized last night that I think this yarn, this white that I'm using, I actually am just not sure. It's definitely, oh, I think these two are different. So I'm pretty sure that this is Faru and I have picked it up at some point through here because I was noticing that it's a little bit shinier. This is Harrisville Singles. Um, keep your materials separate. Somehow I picked up this white bundle, which now I'm just gonna keep using, but the Faru is a very similar size to the Harrisville. Um, or Faro, the Swedish yarn. But it's got some spell sow in it, and so it looks a little bit different. It's actually shinier, which I like. I just think that I didn't use it at the beginning of the piece, so. <laughs> we'll see if we can tell. 
when it comes off. Um, I don't really have much room here, so just gonna do this. What was Abby Franklemont's class going to be? Oh, a spinning one, obviously. Yeah, Abby's great. Um, Abby Franklemont, if you want to learn spinning and you don't want to wheel, she has. She's really good with um, spindles. She grew up in Peru, and she has a book about spindle spinning, and she also has some videos that are worth watching. So if you're interested in learning to spin, but you don't want to get a spinning wheel, check out Abby Franquamont. Use that special yarn. I did say that. I have some... Um, yarn that I got when my teacher James Kohler died um, from his estate sale and I had been saving it so for my book for the samples in my book I felt like it was a perfect use of this yarn I used I actually only used one color that James died but I used it in almost every sample so I felt that that was a cool use of his yarn because he would have the la he wanted to write a techniques book and he didn't get the chance, so I thought it was kind of fun to use his yarn. So that's just an example of use that special yarn. Um, oh yeah, Linda, you got a bunch of good books. Uh, the Traditional Weavers of Guatemala book is fantastic. Really love that book. I love all the books that Thrums Publishing does, so beware of, beware, but go to their website and just, they're all beautiful. I really also, I did a um, blog post about the book that's about Laos, which is also fascinating. Another Thrums book. Thrums, is it thrums.com? If you just Google Thrums Books, you'll find it. So, Paul is asking, when I transitioned from 16 back to eight, did you put new wool thread in the same shed as the 16? I put it in the eight. Paula, that's a good question. Um, and, and so the, I just went straight from 16 and then I put the wool in the eight and um, this this weft bundle wouldn't have worked in the 16 anyway. I would have had lice. I could have split this bundle and put um, a weft of one pick of um, one strand of this in the shed at 16 and that would have spread this out a little bit and, and made it so that this wool doesn't cover that little thing, but I wanted it to do that. Um, so I'm not saying that that's, this is the way you should do it. I'm saying you should experiment and figure out what works for um, what you want it to look like. Is that new book by Deborah, um, Kate, is that new book by Deborah Chandler out? The one about, um, Textile tourism. Um, Deborah Chandler lives and works in Guatemala now. And um, she wrote that um, book about Gua traditional weavers of Guatemala I was just talking about. And uh, you might also know her from Learning to Weave, which was the book from which I learned to um, weave on a shaft loom. Yes. Jeannie, I am sewing this slit as I go. 
So um, this is the only slit I've sewn in this whole piece. And here's the thread that I'm just carrying up as I go along. Oh, Nancy, sure. Um, I think I had this out in a previous post and I'm not gonna find it right now, but I have a um, five inch weaving needle. It's about this long and um, it's just a needle like this, but it's five inches long. They're made by Susan Bates. If you just go to Amazon and look for Susan Bates weaving needle, and if you put in five inches, that might help. Um, I have found them at Joann's, but it's sporadic. And they're not always on Amazon. Um, it feels like they come and go, so watch for them. Get a couple if you find them. They're really um, useful. Yes, Tony, the bubbling is completely different at different sets. She's asking whether the bubbling at 16 EPI is different than the bubbling at 8 EPI, and most certainly it's different. Um, at 16 EPI, I'm not even really bubbling. I'm just um, sort of tapping the weft in as I go across. It's a whole new world, 16 EPI. It's very different. So your weft tension will change with every variable you change. If you change the set or the yarn you're using or the warp you're using, how thick it is, your bubbling will change. Which is why I am so frequently recommend that y'all pick one yarn when you're, if you're a beginner, pick one weft yarn and one warp yarn to learn on because the weft tension changes with every variable you change. So it's hard to learn how to do something if you're changing, if the variables are shifting all the time, it's hard to learn how to manage them. However, many of you soldier on and change all of the variables all the time and you do fine. So to each their own. Um, Respect the Spindle. That's right, Nora. Um, Abby Franklemont's book is Respect the Spindle. Um, and she does have some videos on YouTube. It feels to me like I watched a video that Interweave did with her also, which who knows whether that is actually available at the moment, but um, it might be. I'm not sure what the status of Interweave's videos are. Um, yes, Kathleen Thrums is publishing um, a book by Linda Teller-Pete and Barbara um, Teller-Ornelis, who is her sister, this fall um, about, it's a how-to Navajo weaving book taught by actual Navajo people. So I am very much looking forward to that book. Linda and Barbara are teaching right before me at Harrisville this year. Maybe. If we, if we are teaching in Harrisville, <laughs> Linda and Barbara will be there. Actually, I'm not sure the release date of that book. I heard some other rumors about it, but I know that it's in process and it's a great, it's going to be a great book. Um, Wow, Lori got a whole jackpot of mail with a Saf two looms and a Kathy Tanecker book. Awesome. Um, so let's see. Textile Tourist book came out last year. Kate, how did I miss that? Okay, I will look for that one. Um, wait, I'm making myself a note. I think I remember seeing it and then as life does, pass me by. Um, yeah, isn't that interesting, Sue? Sue's talking about, we were talking about the sort of, not really ridging in the foot, but how prominent the, um, the ribs look. 
um, in this area versus this area. So, and now that it's completed, I do think it looks a little bit different, but <clears throat> differences in the yarn used, I think is the main thing there. <clears throat> I had the medium handy woman loom, Eva. The one I was showing you all the other day is, um, I have two medium sizes. Sorry, you don't want that good of a close up of my face. <laughs> um, this one is the medium size. And uh, I think she makes a smaller one and maybe a larger one. Um, yes, Kazuko said she found some of the Susan Bates needles on Amazon. They come and go. It's a weird product. I suspect they're made in China or something, but um, I do sometimes find them at Joann's, and when I find them at Joann's, I usually buy as many as they have. Um, yeah, Eva, I really like the medium size. I think it's, um, she's asking about this loom, which is, um, this is my sort of Hoket loom replacement, although I have many Hoket looms that I still use. Um, it's about 10 inches long. I just feel like it's um, it's long enough that I can weave a small piece and have a good shed, but small enough that I can use it for traveling, which, or um, sitting on the deck these days. I don't know when we're gonna be traveling again. Um, <laughs> Jeannie, that's funny. The video is much clearer now that my glasses are cleaned. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, oh gosh, you guys have had some fun adventures. Um, so Nan is asking about, um, yeah, if the Harrisville thing happens, I'm actually scheduled to be at Rhinebeck, which is the New York Sheep and Wool Festival. I'm not completely convinced that that's going to happen. But um, I mean, if it happens, I will be there signing books, actually, because my book will come out. Um, we will have pre-orders of pre-copies of the book at Rhinebeck, which is just a couple weeks before the book is released. And I will be there if Rhinebeck happens. Obviously, if Rhinebeck doesn't happen, I won't be there. We're also going to do a book lunch party at Harrisville whether you're taking the workshop I'm teaching there or not. If you live in New England, you can come to my book launch party. Um, again, if it happens. We'll see. It's in October, so we have a little time. Cool, Michelle, thanks. Yeah, I figured you could still access Interweave videos that you'd purchased before. I just didn't know if they were still selling them, but um, Abby does have a good um, spinning video through Interweave, I think. Um, <laughs> cool. Um, oh, cool, Nan. I'll see you there, um, if I'm there. So I hope you all had a good weekend. Oh, I almost forgot. Um, I had two things to tell you today. One was to go get Tucking the Tails by Sarah Sweat. The other was that I am going to decrease the frequency of Change the Shed. And um, for some of you, that will be disappointing. For me, it is um, necessary. I can't come every day, but I will be here on Wednesday this week. So today, and I won't be here tomorrow, but I will be here on Wednesday. And then um, I'll let you know on Wednesday. Um, next week, I'll probably be here Monday and Wednesday. Um, but I will let you know on Wednesday. And um, Colorado is starting to release their stay at home. They're calling it, instead of safe at home, they're calling it safer at home. Um, I don't really think that's going to change my life much because all of the places are mostly still closed. But um, I'm going to do some of my own weaving. And I just saw some thumbs down. I'm sorry, you guys. I... Um, I have other work that I have to do and it's um, not getting done because I'm spending a lot of time doing this and I love being here and I will still be here. I just won't be here every day. So um, um, yeah, so I'll see you on Wednesday. In the meantime, do some weaving and I love seeing what you're doing 
with the hashtags and um, that kind of thing on social media. And um, it's been really fun. So I will still be here, I suspect, for a long time. I just can't do it every day. So it's been four weeks of every day. So um, I'll see you on Wednesday. And um, I also have... Thanks, Marlena. Marlena is my coach in the background of um, stop apologizing. I do apologize a lot. I almost just said, I'm sorry, I apologize too much. Um, There is also a live Q&A for uh, the design class if you're in that on Wednesday. Both things will happen on Wednesday. So I will see you then. Keep weaving and y'all are awesome. And I'll see you in two days right here.